<laughs> ah, what's good? What's good? Hey, how's it going? Well, if you've been on the internet lately, you've probably heard about NFTs. And if you haven't been on the internet lately, I'm very jealous of you. Because it seems that NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, are basically everywhere lately. And these little pixel art things have got me wondering if those beanie babies I had stuck in the back of my closet were actually worth something. And whether it's Discord teasing integrating them into their platform, Twitter talking about doing the same, or this front page Rolling Stone ad for the Board Ape Yacht Club, it seems like these things are kind of inescapable lately. And if you listen to their proponents, this is the crest of Web3. It's the big next revolutionary wave of the internet. Everything's going to be on the blockchain. There's going to be cryptocurrencies and NFTs. And for all that enthusiasm that's coming from the top, there's also been very public pushback and very good reasons to be skeptical. Now, very talented people and very funny people have made some really great content pointing out the holes in NFTs and making fun of the whole thing, but I want to approach this a little bit differently. And that means that we need to define some terms and then we get to talk about Marxism. So what actually is the blockchain? The blockchain. Well, despite all the zeros and ones floating around behind me, it's not nearly this complicated or this cool looking. It looks a little bit more like, like this. It's an accounting ledger, it's a spreadsheet. The difference between the blockchain and an Excel sheet that people like you and me probably use every day is that instead of being stored in one place, it's decentralized. So the blockchain is split across a bunch of different computers, and that is really the foundation on which all cryptocurrency operates. You've got a big accounting ledger. It's decentralized across different computers and different machines. But beyond that, the basic idea is the same. But you're going to want to buckle in because I'm about to get a little bit silly. You see, instead of just being able to add normal rows to the spreadsheet like you would in like Excel or a sheet of paper, in order to add new information to the blockchain, a person has to have their computer solve arbitrary math problems. Solving these problems validates that new information so that the block of information can get added to the chain. Get it? The blockchain. And the person whose computer solves those problems is able to get a fancy new piece of cryptocurrency. And the bigger the ledger gets, the more complicated these problems are going to get. Hence why you hear about these giant server farms that are used only to farm Bitcoin. It's also the reason why my graphics card that I bought six years ago is worth more today than it was when I bought it. And if you're a fan of critically acclaimed MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV that has a free trial that includes all the content up to level 60, including the Heaven's Ward expansion, it's also the reason you can't log into Endwalker because the drive to buy graphics cards has caused a superconductor shortage, and it's the reason, or at least a contributing reason, why Square Enix couldn't get servers. <laughs> you see, as more people have gotten into crypto, the complexity of those problems increases, right? Which means you need more powerful computers, and those more powerful computers need more energy to solve those more complicated problems. Now, that might seem silly, but yeah, guess what? Turns out that as of March 2021, the Bitcoin network alone, not talking about other coins or Ethereum or anything like that, was using the same amount of energy that the average American household would use in 13 years to mine a single Bitcoin. Let that sit in for a second. 13 years worth of electricity not spent powering appliances or heating a home or doing anything practical. It's solving arbitrary math problems to mine magic internet money. All right, you still following? You still with me? All right, that's the blockchain. Let's talk about an NFT. So what the heck is an NFT? Well, it's kind of silly because you see a non-fungible token or NFT is an entry into the blockchain. So it's a line on that ledger that says that a given account or wallet owns a particular thing. And that can be anything. It can be music. 
It can be pictures of a VTuber's feet. It can be the word VTuber. Basically, anything can be an NFT because you can attach this certificate of ownership to it. So no, the monkey is not the NFT. The NFT is basically a post-it note that has been stuck on it that says that this person owns this thing. So let's see what that looks like in action. <laughs> Uh, well, you might say that sounds a little bit like someone trying to sell you a bridge. And brother, it is much sillier than that. Because you see, if somebody tries to sell you a bridge, there's actually a bridge there. If I buy a deed to the Brooklyn Bridge, I can look at the Brooklyn Bridge. It's actually there. But kind of like with NFTs, I can't stop people from just walking across the bridge, just like the owner of an NFT can't stop somebody from just right-clicking and saving that picture. The big difference, like I said, is that you get a fancy certificate when you buy the bridge, and you don't need a smartphone or a computer to access it, and you didn't need to spend years worth of electricity in order to compute arbitrary math problems in order to prove your ownership of it. You've just got a piece of paper. Now, trust me when I say that the last section of this video took several takes and a lot of rewriting. And every time I thought I was being unfair, every time I thought that I was being dishonest, I went back, I did more research and it always got worse. You see, there's some very good reasons to be skeptical of NFTs, but you know what? I'm going to table a lot of those. I'm going to level with crypto enthusiasts for the rest of this video, and I'm going to entertain the idea that all the issues with global warming, power consumption, and the reopening of coal plants to meet the energy demands of crypto mining networks can all be solved. And we're going to assume that crypto is entirely green. And in order to explain why I, even with all of those factors taken off the table, still think NFTs suck, we need to take a trip back. We're going back to the past. We're going to Germany in 1867. And that's right, baby. It's time for my good old boys, Marx and Engels. Um, Marx and Engels. So in their seminal work, Das Kapital, which I'm sure is going to be coming up in future videos, they lay out two terms that I want to use to talk about NFTs specifically, but cryptocurrency more broadly. And those are use value and exchange value. So what do these two mean? Well, use value is really intuitive. The more useful something is, the more use value it has. So for example, this hammer might be made of metal. It's pretty useful. A hammer that is made of wood that is more likely to break or takes more swings is less useful, so it has less use value. You see, an object's use value is a property of its physicality. Now, exchange value is the value to which something can be exchanged for goods and services. So let's take gold in a pre-electronics market, for example. As a metal, gold is pretty bad. It's pretty shitty. It's got a low melting point. It's fragile. It bends easily and so on and so on and so on. But it is, like me, very pretty. And so it is, like me, valued very highly. Now, in a capitalist market, exchange value is the primary means by which we evaluate different objects. So when we think about NFTs as a commodity, it's hard to think about them, in fact, almost impossible to think about them as having any kind of real use value, right? There's nothing physical here. There's just a picture of monkey and a line in a, in a digital spreadsheet that says that you own, oh my, it's so dumb. It broke my model with how dumb it is. Anyway, now to be fair, some of these NFTs do come with other perks. There's promises of membership in a club, or maybe the person that owns the NFT also owns the monetization rights for the thing or the character or what have you. There's also this awful hippo breeding thing. Just, just look at it for a second. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. But moving on. Even with those other perks, it's hard to value them because their value is speculative. 
The value of your membership in the club is really only as valuable as the club itself. And now in other speculative markets like art and real estate, there's a physical thing there. There's something grounding that value. And sure, that studio apartment in a basement that you're renting for $2,000 a month probably isn't worth that. But you can live there. There's a thing that you can touch and feel. But that's not the case with NFTs. There's nothing to ground their value, meaning that their value is limited only to what the owner of the NFT can convince you it is. And this is true of cryptocurrencies more generally, and not just NFTs. It's why you see these massive fluctuations in response to tweets by celebrities. The value of a cryptocurrency or an NFT is really just limited to what you can convince another person it is. So that person who bought that JPEG of a lion for $150,000 and is trying to flip it to somebody else has got to make people think that it is worth more than they bought it for. Which means NFT enthusiasts can never stop talking about NFTs. Because if they stop, well then the bubble is going to burst. They need to keep evangelizing. They need to keep telling people about how this is the future and this is what everyone's going to be using in 10, 20, 30 years. Because if they don't, that bubble might burst and they might be stuck holding the bag. So if the best way to get a return on your investment in NFTs is to convince other people to buy into NFTs, we just call that a pyramid scheme. Because you see, at the end of the day, NFTs are a product of hyper-capitalism. There is no physical thing grounding them. And if you think back to exchange and use value, that means that the sky is the limit. There's no use value to speak of. It's all just what you can exchange them for. And that means that NFTs are a market ripe for speculation, manipulation, and fraud. So when you see these big sale notices that say that the digital certificate of ownership of a pixelated image of a cartoon head just sold for half a million dollars, it is way more likely that that's a particular kind of market manipulation called wash selling, wherein one person or a group of people pass these things around to build up a fake record of account activity to make these things seem incredibly valuable so that when some new person comes in and they want to buy the thing, thinking it's a smart investment, they're making that decision based on fake information. It is extremely illegal in regulated markets, but it's common in NFT spaces. How common? Well, Nature, the, uh, the cool science magazine, Nature, recently published a study in NFT networks. And the results suggest that wash selling is incredibly common in NFT markets. In some cases, up to 90% of transactions occur between just 10% of traders. Meaning that these tight clusters of color that you see there, those are evidence that something's up here. That small groups of people are hyping this stuff up, are passing these things amongst themselves, driving up their speculative value. And that doesn't seem like a sustainable market, does it? You see, all that talk about Web3 and empowering artists and all that stuff, it's just not the material reality here. I don't buy the hype and you shouldn't either. You see, from the bottom up, NFTs are a bubble market. They're gonna pop and a lot of people are gonna lose money. And everyone in the game that's hustling for it hopes that it's not them. So it's actually kinda easy to understand why would an individual person wanna get into NFTs? It's a promise of getting rich quick. It's asset flipping. It's, it's, it's just a hustle. But what about those big companies? Remember Discord? Remember Twitter? Why are they trying to get into this game? What do they stand to gain here? Well, to talk about that, we need to talk about capitalism. So this here is a pretty basic supply demand graph. If you've taken an econ course, you know what I'm gonna say. If you haven't, let's talk for a second here. You see the basic tenant here that you need to take away is that as supply goes down, and demand increases, well, then you can expect price to also increase, right? It's a, it's a pretty simple equation. But how does that hold up in the age of the internet where you can just save a file or copy it and there's no reason that the new created copy has to be less valuable than the original? It's like 
there's no such thing as supply anymore. You can just create more copies as long as you have space. So for big tech companies, I'm going to make a wild shot in the dark and say that their enthusiasm around NFTs is about creating a potential way to open new avenues of monetizing digital goods and digital spaces. And that's probably why I can't use YouTube anymore without seeing crypto ads, or why I can't go a full day without hearing someone tell me about how crypto is the future. It's the best money we're ever going to have. You see, the big orgs that control those digital spaces stand to open up a whole new world of monetization by being able to slap ownership onto things, which allows them to say that the original or any one of them is more valuable than the copies. If you're over the age of 30, you already know what this is. If you're under the age or if you manage to somehow avoid acquiring this particular brand of brainworm, let me enlighten you. This is the giant omelet. It was part of the game Neopets where you raised internet pets and they were really cute. And part of the game is that every day, every player could go take a piece of the giant omelet. And the next day, there would be a new omelet. Now, there wasn't a limit to say that only the first thousand people would be able to get a piece or anything like that. There was as much as there needed to be for every player because there was no real omelet to run out. It was a digital good. And to a young Ricky, this was a glimpse of a post-scarcity world. You see, NFTs are kind of the opposite of the omelet. The expressed idea of an NFT is to be able to create a stamp of authenticity that says that the copy is worth less than the original. It's a way of really inventing scarcity where it doesn't have to exist at the cost of the many in order to enrich the very few. There are a lot of very good reasons to be skeptical of cryptocurrency and NFTs and Web3 and all that that have nothing to do with power consumption or the goofy math problems and everything at the heart of cryptocurrency. They don't even have anything to do with this awful ape cartoon that just exists for some reason. And you know what? It might be worse than the hippos. I, mm, and moving on, moving on, moving on. So yeah, when you put all that stuff back into the equation, it becomes a pretty bleak image. You see, if, if NFTs are part of the future, it's not a future that I want to live in. Growing up, I really believed in the idea of the internet as a place for the free exchange of information between people. And since then, as I've gotten older, I've seen that idealistic, almost even utopian vision commodified and sold back to me in progressively smaller pieces. So to me, NFTs aren't anything new. They're just a brazen extension of a long-running ideological project to take something that seems good, that seems utopian, and strip it for spare parts. You see, the problem isn't the power usage. The power isn't the math problems. It's not even the ape cartoon. The problem is capitalism. There you got it. I wanted to make this video for a while, and I've stripped it, and I remade it, and I've gone back and done more research, and it's always gotten worse. And I'll be honest, I hope it was informative. I hope, it, I hope you had a laugh. I hope maybe you got a commiserative chuckle or two. But this stuff gets bleak. And this stuff gets very lonely the more that you think about it. So I don't want to end on a downer. I want to end on a quote that I think about pretty regularly lately. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. So that's it till next time. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. After all, really, each other is all we got on this big spinning rock. So... <laughs> I hope you have a good one. Take care.